If I asked you what the first thing is that comes to mind when I mention the Cuban Mafia in the United States, most would say the movie Scarface with Al Pacino. Those more immersed in the history of crime will remember the Coke dealers, whose wars in 1980s Miami almost drowned the city in blood. However, few will mention Jose Miguel Battle and the Corporation Gang, and that they were the ones who received the very name Cuban Mafia. Battle began in New York as the owner of a small underground lottery that in the States is known as a numbers game, and rose to the head of the organization with a total of 2,500 members. The corporation made millions of dollars a week, competed equally with the Italian Mafia, built casinos in Latin America, and in the world of Cuban organized crime, was an authority even for the before-mentioned illegal substance traffickers from Cuba. And if you're interested in hearing about the most powerful Cuban gang in the United States, then meet the corporation on the other side of the law. Our story today begins in the Cuban town of Altosango, where Jose Miguel Battle was born in 1929. There, he completed his schooling and then joined the National Police Force at the age of 19. After one and a half years, he would be transferred to Havana, where he became an investigator in a unit that dealt with gambling. For the most part, the Havana police of the time were dirty. Police officers supported their families not on their salaries, but on the payments they received from brothels, gambling establishments, nightclubs, and other entertainment venues. They were paid and allowed to work in peace. Battle, unlike the heroes of Hollywood movies about brave cops, did not try to change the system, but on the contrary, very successfully fit into it. In a couple of years, he went from someone who collected tributes from small joints for his next closest boss to a man who delivered payments from luxury casinos in President Batista's palace. This position forced Jose Miguel to roll in the highest circles of organized crime, where he was able to make good acquaintances quite successfully. He became friends with the then owner of the luxury nightclub Tropicana, named Martin Fox, who built his career on Bolita. For those who don't know, Bolita is an underground lottery, analogous to the number games that became popular in the States in the early 20th century. I'll tell you more about it a little later. Fox, in turn, introduced Battle to the Tampa mob boss Santo Traficante Jr., for whom Jose Miguel began to shadow, sharing necessary gang information from police records. This acquaintance would help Battle a lot in the future when he moved to the United States. The life of being a corrupt cop ended for Jose Miguel in 1959, when the Castro movement started the Socialist Revolution. He was transferred from the gambling squad to traffic enforcement. There were no more bribes from the casinos, as there were no more casinos, and the new position was not at all the job of his dreams. So Battle decided to move to the U.S. by the end of the year. There he stayed in a New Jersey town called Union City bought a rundown bar, and began to think about how to move his wife and son. However, his measured plans were interrupted by the news that the CIA was recruiting Cubans for a military operation to overthrow the Castro regime. Battle had well-informed connections who helped him sign up as a volunteer. A couple of months later, he was already preparing for an operation in a secret camp in the mountains of Guatemala. What they were being prepared for would later be called the Battle of the Bay of Pigs, and would become one of the most humiliating military defeats in the history of the United States. We're not going to get into why that happened. There are a lot of nuances that would take a whole separate video. In the context of our hero, this invasion is interesting, because he would later receive an unofficial title of War Hero, which would favorably distinguish him later among the Cuban-American diaspora. The incident for which he received this title was as follows. When the brigade landed and moved a little deeper into the interior of the island, one of its units was caught in a severe ambush. One soldier managed to pick his way out of the siege and found the unit where battle was. Upon hearing the story, Jose Miguel immediately jumped into the only truck his squad had, and with two other guys, a machine gun and some small weapons, went to pull the men out of the ambush. By some miracle, they managed not only to get to the battlefront unharmed, but also successfully pulled out the whole squad, though by that time, there were only 11 men left. However, such heroism still failed to turn the tides of the operation. 
The rebel brigade was defeated and its remnants thrown into a Cuban prison. There, they spent more than a year before Castro and Kennedy were able to negotiate an exchange. Cuba gave America the prisoners and, in exchange, received farm equipment, medicine, and food. Many who participated in the invasion would later devote their lives to fighting against Castro. Though Battle would later help such groups with money, he was a more down-to-earth person, and despite his undisguised hatred of Castro, he thought first about solving the immediate problems. When they were returned to the U.S., they all received an offer to join the U.S. Army. Battle, not knowing what else to do, accepted the offer and was finally able to move his wife and child to the States. He stayed in the service for about a year before leaving and moving to Union City. By this time, he had sold the bar and needed to find a new way to make money. That's when an opportunity came up for him to get into the Belita business. His old pal, Angel Mujica, who had served with him in the Havana police force as well as in the same squad that landed in Cuba at the Bay of Pigs, offered battle to join him in co-owning a small Belita betting house. For lack of other prospects, Jose Miguel accepted his old comrade's offer. They could hardly have imagined then that this endeavor would lead to the birth of one of the most powerful Cuban gangs in the United States. What is Bolita anyway? In literal translation, the word means little ball. The origin of the name of this gambling game dates back to the first half of the 20th century and refers to the Cuban National Lottery. It uses dozens of small balls with different numbers, which were placed in a bag. From there, one ball was pulled out, and whoever's number was picked was the winner of the day. Since not everyone could afford to play the Cuban National Lottery due to low incomes, clever street hustlers started taking bets on it for several times less than the amount needed to play the legal lottery. Thus, Bolita was born. Anyone, even the poorest Havana resident, could come to a Bolitero and bet a few pesos. Over time, the Cuban National Lottery was not the only way to determine a winning number. Most often, bulleteros were oriented on horse race results at the racetrack. In this case, each bulletero determined for himself how exactly to get the winning number. Some had up to 100 numbers, some up to 500, and the especially wealthy could bet up to 1,000. Accordingly, the coefficient which your sum was multiplied by in the case of a win was equal to the amount of numbers in the drawing. That is, times 100, or 500, or 1,000, if you go by the numbers that I mentioned earlier. And since the minimum bet was equal to the minimum denomination of Cuban currency, practically all the inhabitants of poor neighborhoods played bolita. From the lowlifes to the grandmas. After all, considering the conventional one peso, there's not much you can buy with it, so why not try your luck and turn it into 500 or maybe even 1,000 pesos? Bolita became the national pastime of the poor. People developed whole systems on how to pick the right number, and esoteric hustlers came up with special dream books that helped determine the right number to bet. In the 1960s, Cubans began to flee en masse to the U.S. from the Castro regime, and along with them came a lot of other national characteristics, among them the love for Belita. Sooner or later, inadequate supply had to appear to meet this demand. And it was Jose Miguel Battle who provided it. When he accepted his colleague's offer to become a partner in his Bolita operation, he found that the enterprise was extremely small and had no chance for rapid growth, because no matter how trivial it sounds, everything depended on money and connections. First, contacts in the police and with politicians were needed, so that when expanding it would not receive constant raids. And secondly, funds were needed to cover the winnings. The more people there were betting, the higher the chance that the winning number would have a huge payout. That's where Battle's Cuban connection came in handy. He contacted Santo Traficante Jr. and arranged a meeting. At the meeting, he explained to the mafioso that he wanted to build a large bolita business in the Cuban enclaves in New York and Union City, but he needed the help of Cosa Nostra to do it. Battle offered to pay a monthly percentage of his profits, and in return, he wanted protection from the authorities and help in covering especially large winnings. Santo Traficante promised him that he would talk to the local bosses, but it would still be up to them to decide. After that, Battle had two meetings. 
one with Sam de Cavalcante in New Jersey, who headed the local family at the time, the other in New York with the Genovese family representative Anthony Salerno. Santo Traficante attended both meetings and helped battle and negotiate a partnership with them. Thus, the foundation of the corporation was laid. Gaining the support of the Mafia, Battle's organization began to grow by leaps and bounds. I say Battle's organization because his partner, who called Jose Miguel into the business, could not cope with the pressure and gradually receded into the background. After a while, he fell completely out of the business. Battle, on the other hand, built up an impressive Polita operation in a couple of years, spread out in the Cuban quarters of New York and Union City. The system was set up like a real legitimate company. At the very top was Battle. Below him were the bankers, the people who ran one or more of the betting shops. The bankers, on the other hand, had a lot of people under them. First, there was the branch that dealt with taking bets. It included runners, those who directly accepted bets on the street. And there were so-called office workers, people who sat in special apartments where runners brought bets and accepted money. Secondly, there were accountants who kept records of all the finances of the organization and distributed payments, ranging from gang members' salaries to bribes for politicians and cops. Third, there was the power block. These guys were in charge of security. They took out the guys who decided to bail on the organization, handled if any runners got robbed. They guarded the offices, and most importantly, they were in charge of moving the money from the offices to the accountants and then to the stash houses. This whole complex system brought their owners about $50,000 a day. Did all that money go into Battle's pocket? Of course not. It was necessary to pay people, to give the promised share to the mafiosi, and most importantly to appease politicians and police. So, Battle paid the Union City Chief of Police, Herman Bolt, who left him off the hook with the city's mayor, William Musto, who also received money from the corporation. Such acquaintances made Jose Miguel a very influential man in town, and later he would further penetrate into local politics by helping various people get their positions. However, even these connections could not keep Battle from being persecuted by the authorities. As soon as Bolita's business became visible to the public eye, the FBI went after Jose Miguel and the corporation. They developed the case for about four years, and in 1970, finally handed it over to the prosecutor's office. It went to trial in July of that year. Fourteen people, including Battle, were accused of conspiracy to organize illegal gambling. Jose Miguel made bail and fled to Spain. I don't know what he was thinking at the time, but Battle didn't stay there long, eventually returning to the States. That deferred sentence was worth a fugitive charge as well. He was incredibly lucky, however. The Racketeer Influenced and Corrupt Organizations Act, or RICO law, didn't pass until months after the prosecutor filed his charges. So in all, Jose Miguel faced no more than six or seven years. Under RICO, he would have gotten 30. In the end, Battle was sentenced to 18 months in prison, which he owed to his lawyers who got a great deal in exchange for a guilty plea. Meanwhile, on the outside, the first serious problems within his gang were already brewing, which would give rise to what Cuban crime simply cannot exist without. Hundreds of gunshots and dozens of bodies. Jose Miguel, as the leader of the corporation, was against the coke trade. He believed that Bolita, though it brought less in, was safer in the long run. However, not everyone agreed with him. In particular, his two brothers Gustavo and Pedro were doing it in Miami. Then Gustavo went to jail and Pedro moved to New York, where, unknown to his older brother, he continued the trade with another member of the organization nicknamed Ernestico. This character will also be important in the coming narration, so I'll briefly introduce him to you. Ernestico was a boy, barely past the legal age. He had first encountered battle in Spain, where they had been introduced to each other by mutual acquaintances. El Padrino, as Jose Miguel would later be called, grew attached to the young man, who by all measures was an ideal candidate for the role of gangster. Battle offered Ernestico to work for him. Ernestico agreed and back in Spain committed his first murder for the corporation. When Jose Miguel returned to New York, Ernestico went with him. 
Here, he quickly found common ground with Pedro and together began to trade blow. At first, the partners were doing well, the goods were selling, money was being made, and there wasn't much competition. But then a gangster named Palulu came to New York. While still in Miami, he had territorial tensions with the Battle Brothers, and moving and basing his operation near Pedro reopened old wounds. The open conflict began when Palulu's men started selling in Pedro's territory, and Ernestico killed those men and took $20,000 worth of merchandise. This happened just before Jose Miguel got out of jail, and he was furious when he found out. Not only was Gustavo already in jail because of this business, but just a few years earlier, he and Pedro had almost been killed in Miami in a similar conflict. Battle ordered Pedro to quit immediately and keep a low profile for a while. However, though he stopped trading, he could not stop the partying, and it eventually ruined him. A shootout took place in one of the bars where Pedro crossed paths with Palulu, and Jose Miguel's brother was killed. On the one hand, El Padrino was grief-stricken, and on the other, intoxicated with a sense of revenge that would consume him for many years, since Palulu turned out to be one extremely lucky son of a bitch. The vendetta began when Battle contracted his two best hitmen, Ernestico and Chino Acuna, for the kill. The two guys had been searching for Palulu for months. During this time, they managed to torture a couple dozen of his associates and sent about the same number to the other life. Then they finally managed to find out where he was. Palulu met with his remaining partners on certain days in the park. That's where the killers went. Palulu saw them coming and started to run away. During the chase, they managed to shoot him, but since the police arrived so quickly, they couldn't get a good shot off. As a result, Palulu was taken to the hospital with multiple wounds in his leg, which had to be amputated. Later, right after the hospital, he would end up in jail for the murder of Pedro Battle, and Jose Miguel would make more than another attempt to kill him, which we'll talk about later. Right now, however, another problem was surfacing for El Padrino. After Pedro's death, Ernestico started to get out of control. He was no longer allowed to trade blow, and the money he was getting as a soldier in the organization was clearly not enough for him. So he began to pester battle to promote him to banker. Jose Miguel eventually gave in and appointed him. However, Ernestico did not cope well with the work of a banker, incurring only losses, and so El Padrino removed him. Offended by battle, Ernestico decided that he would make his own way and began to use his authority as an assassin to borrow large sums from other bankers and not pay them back. Eventually, he came across one who simply sent him away. Then a terrific idea came into Ernestico's head. Kidnap the banker and demand a ransom from the corporation. But the kidnapping failed, the banker saw Ernestico's face, and the murder that was supposed to clear the debt failed. The other bankers then organized a meeting in which they expressed their displeasure with Ernestico to battle. Everyone knew that he was like an adopted son to Jose Miguel and were afraid to speak out on their own. El Padrino listened to his men and agreed with them. Ernestico had to die. The first attempted hit was made in New York but ended in failure. After that, Ernestico fled to Miami. There he was shot a couple more times but also without much success. The most serious injury was a forearm wound. That's when Jose Miguel decided he had to take matters into his own hands. He, along with the organization's top killers, went to Miami. With the help of the local Cuban underworld, they managed to figure out Ernestico's new hideout. Battle went on the hit with his men, personally putting a bullet between the eyes of his adopted son. Ernestico was in an apartment when the hit took place, along with his girlfriend, Idaria Fernandez who by some miracle managed to survive. The police found her in a pool of blood and immediately sent her to the hospital. Idaria became the first witness in Ernestico's murder trial. The second was his friend Charlie Hernandez. He was very close to Ernestico and had also been involved in several robberies of Bolita bankers. Logically, he should have been the next victim, so to save his life he started snitching. Charlie gave investigators the whole backstory of the assassination attempt, describing Battle as the main suspect. And Dadia identified one of the assassins 
as Chino Acuna. She didn't say anything about Jose Miguel's involvement out of fear. Then, in the course of the investigation, more people were found who confirmed the testimonies of the two main witnesses. They also proved Jose Miguel's personal participation in the hit. The case turned out to be settled, and Battle received 30 years in prison. And that would have been the end of the Cuban Godfather's story before it even began, if it hadn't been for one thing. His lawyers found the smallest loophole they could find. They appealed because the text of the conviction was too vague. Conventionally, it read, The defendant conspired with Chino Acuna or other unknown persons. Such wording was too ambiguous. It was unclear whether he conspired with Acuna or with someone else. If there had been a conjunction and the text read and instead of or, then there was no question. But these kinds of mistakes allowed the defense lawyers to get the case revisited. From there, the defense attorneys went to the prosecution and offered a deal. They would withdraw the murder charge and Jose Miguel would plead guilty to ordering the murder. The prosecutors agreed, but they did not yet know the most important thing. Battle had a more cooperative judge at the new trial, if you know what I mean. So instead of last year's 30, he only got probation. And while El Padrino didn't get punished, these events changed him. Polita was making him a lot of money, he had the politicians of the whole city in his pocket, and the law couldn't get to him no matter what he did. All of this was changing the way the former corrupt cop and Bay of Pigs battle hero looked at the world, turning him into a ruthless crime boss. And soon enough, every member of his organization would feel it. While the Ernestico murder trial was underway, Battle had been in prison for over two years. During all this time on the outside, the organization was run by his son Miguelito and the only Jewish banker in the organization named Abraham Rides. He had known Jose Miguel since Havana and, because they were old friends, brought him into the Belita business. Rides showed himself to be a very good manager with an excellent grasp of finances. That's why, when Battle was taken down, he asked Abraham to help Miguelito manage the corporation. And despite the almost 20-year age difference, the two men understood each other perfectly. They were both eager to take the organization off the streets and into the legal sector. It was during that period that they began organizing a network of legitimate companies centered in the trade and clothing industry. These firms would become the last hubs where Belita money was turned into legal income. The whole system looked like this. The money received from Bolita was invested in fake companies opened for third parties somewhere in Panama or the Antilles. And these companies would lend money to the legitimate companies of Battle Jr. and Rides, which were located in the US. Then the money would go through the legitimate companies and come out crystal clear. The debt to the fake companies, of course, was repaid only on paper. However, even though the pair's finances held up successfully, the authority of the corporation on the streets began to be questioned. Robberies of runners, internal thefts, and betrayals of organization members became more frequent, and Miguelito often just turned a blind eye to it. And as a cherry on top of the cake, one of the bankers decided to secede from the whole thing. A guy named Isleño Davila declared himself an independent banker and went to work under the protection of the Lucchese Mafia family. A little later, his organization would be called La Compañía and became a second force in the Cuban underworld of New York. When Battle got out, he was not at all happy with what he saw. Building a money laundering system was good, but El Padrino was just as concerned about what was being said about the corporation on the streets. That's why he decided to return the reputation to what it was before he was locked up. In that period, in addition to Ernestico, several more guys were killed, who in one way or another crossed to the line with the organization. This garnered respect based on fear, which was badly lagging in the last couple of years of his absence. Jose Miguel started by augmenting the organization's reach, led by the assassin Conrado Panse, nicknamed Lalo. He then began to give them punitive missions designed to restore the authority of the corporation. In the first three years of Lalo's team's existence, at least a few dozen people were killed. 
Anyone who had previously stolen from the corporation or dared to betray it received retribution. All those who, for whatever reason, had not drawn conclusions from the fates of previous traitors followed in their own footsteps. Was such power intoxicating to battle? Absolutely. It was the 1980s. His organization had been continuously bringing in millions of dollars for two decades, and its total number of members stepped over 2,000. Politicians and police were on his payroll, and with one call, his hitmen could eliminate the right person. However, man is a very strange creature. After achieving what seems like everything he dreamed of at the beginning of his path, he still wanted more. And in the context of gangsters, based on a couple dozen biographies that I've already told on my channel, this craving for more often goes in two directions. Either an increase in wealth or an increase in power. Jose Miguel was more concerned with the latter. The more he stood at the helm of the corporation, the less he tolerated anyone's disobedience, and it was beginning to have unfortunate consequences. Even the longest standing and most loyal members of the organization could come under attack. And here, the most characteristic example is the assassination of Angel Mujica, who had gotten battle into the Belita business. Mujica went out of business in the late 1980s, receiving $300,000 for his shops. He then went to Spain and tried to set up a legal business there, but it went bust, losing all his savings. Then Mujica returned to New York and opened a small bolita joint. Angel realized that he would have to work in Battle's territory, and to avoid controversy, went to an old friend for permission to return to the business. At the meeting, Jose Miguel was extremely cordial and convinced Mujica that he could continue taking bets. But as soon as he left, Battle told his men that he was opening a contract to kill Mujica. El Padrino was offended that Angel had opened the shop first and only then came for permission. He considered it a blow to his authority and killed his old friend. A similar fate befell at least five other people that Battle had started with. They thought they were entitled to leniency, and he believed that such thoughts were a challenge to his authority. The desire for more power was similarly reflected outside the organization. In New York City, the corporation had to share territory with several criminal groups. On one side was La Compañía, under Isleño Davila, and on the other was Cosa Nostra, which had a numbers game almost identical to the underground Bolita lottery. In order to avoid territorial disputes, a system was worked out between these organizations whereby one treaty member could not open a shop within a certain radius of another treaty member's shop. The rule was perfectly observed until 1982. Then the cops closed down one of La Compañía's betting houses. Formally, the area was free, so the corporation took it over. But La Compañía did not think so and reopened its shop. So the two betting houses were practically neighbors, which inevitably led to disagreements. A separate meeting was going to be held to resolve this dispute, where it seemed like Battle and Davila were able to come to an agreement. However, almost immediately thereafter, one of La Compañía's shops burned down, and a corporation joint opened in the neighborhood. Davila immediately responded with the exact same move. After this, a meeting was again organized with Davila, Battle, and representatives of the Lucchese family. Then the representatives of the Genovese family, which did business with Jose Miguel, also tried to appease the Cubans by organizing a meeting. Finally, in 1983, they all came together. Genovese, Lucchese, the corporation, and La Compañía. But none of the meetings had the desired effect. Moreover, right after the last one, a member of the corporation was killed, and the shooters were identified as members of the Lucchese family. Plus, having seen the disagreements between the Cuban boleteros, even despite the peaceful meetings, the Lucchese's continued to quietly occupy the corporation's territory. And all of this combined eventually led to a string of arson attacks on illegal lottery outlets. Battle was not afraid to challenge the Cosa Nostra, and actually fought it for two years, from 1983 to 1985. This conflict claimed the lives of several dozen people, including eight civilians, and was also characterized by the largest number of fires, 
which was common in the history of criminal organizations in the US. Illegal lottery outlets burned more than 60 times during those days. The arsons died down only when a little girl was involved in one of the fires. That incident shook up the public and the criminals eased up. Whether they had peace talks after that is not known, but the conflict after this incident came to a pause. By this time, Battle himself had already moved to Miami. There he built a kind of ranch with a total area of 22 and a half acres, where Jose Miguel played the role of farmer. He hired people, some of which cultivated the land, while others were engaged in breeding fighting roosters. El Padrino, on the other hand, just walked around it all, and he must have been reminded of his childhood days in a small Cuban town. On top of that, Battle started running into the biggest local boletero in Miami named Oscar Alvarez. El Padrino felt that the local bankers should pay him a percentage since he had moved to Miami. The local bankers didn't agree, so Jose Miguel decided to get the message across through a hidden run on Alvarez by attempting to kill his right-hand man, Gerardo Zayas. Surprisingly, Alvarez did not retaliate, but simply went out of business and left Miami. Most of the remaining bankers defected to the corporation afterward. However, that was not El Padrino's main victory during this period. He was finally able to get his brother Pedro's killer, who was proving to be a miracle of survival. And what I tell you next is more like the script of some dark comedy than a real story. Truly, life is the best writer. When Palulu survived the first assassination attempt, Jose Miguel put an open hit on him for $100,000. Enthusiasts were found almost immediately, and already in prison, Palulu was stabbed in the back. However, he remained alive. After this incident, he spent the rest of his sentence among hardened criminals in a cell block for prisoners whose misdeeds could cost them their lives. In prison, Battle was unable to get his brother's killer. When he did get out, however, he was almost immediately tried for murder. A hitman, wanting the 100,000, caught up with Palulu on the street and opened fire. A gunfight ensued, resulting in Palulu being shot in the chest. And yes, he survived again. He also got jail time for illegally carrying a gun. Released from prison after two years, he again got into a shootout with bounty hunters after that 100,000. This time he came out unscathed, but again went to jail for illegal possession of a gun. Upon his release, Palulu returned to New York again. But this time, Battle had already closed the contract and entrusted the hit to his chief enforcer, Lalo Panse. He did everything perfectly. Hid in the foyer of Palulu's house, waited for him to walk right past him. He came out of his ambush and shot him in the back of the head. Palulu fell to the floor but survived again. The bullet somehow magically entered the skull but didn't hit the brain inside. That's when Battle decided to go into action himself. He took the organization's top killers, picked up Palulu outside his house, and literally made a sieve out of him. Eleven bullets are pulled out of Palulu's body by the doctors. But yeah, he didn't die this time. It was a tough surgery several days in a coma, but he stayed alive. By this time, the rumors that Palulu can't be killed and that he's El Diablo were already in full circle on the streets. And since such talk could badly stain the authority of the corporation, Battle decided to take a risk and sent a killer to finish the job right in the hospital. After sneaking into the room, he fired several bullets at Palulu at close range a couple in the heart area, and a couple in the head. And this time, no miracle could save Palulu. Pedro Battle was avenged. Jose Miguel then threw a party in Miami that lasted almost a week. He and his cronies got drunk and indulged in carnal pleasures, claiming that his brother could now rest in peace. However, that was probably the only reason to rejoice. The rest of the time, Battle was extremely tense. When he left for Miami, he left his brother-in-law, Nene Marquez, in charge of the organization. He did this not only to get high in his luxurious home without the pressing issues of business, but also to distance himself from the then-raging war with the Mafia. 
With all the conflict with the Mafia, the endless series of murders in the Cuban underworld, and the increasingly visible Belita operation, the authorities were forced to reconsider their views on the Cuban crime issue. And battle, as the most visible part of that world, was attracting the most attention. Actually, that's why he went to Miami, to play the role of a retired criminal. However, immediately after the hit on Alvarez, the authorities received information from informants that Battle was continuing his activities there as well. This information reached El Padrino very soon. It was clear that the attempt to get off the radar failed, and it was necessary to think of something else. In the end, this something else was the first casino in Peru and a move there. The story began when several businessmen from Peru asked for help in finding an investor from an acquaintance of Battles named De Villiers. They claimed they could get permission to open a casino in the country's capital. They themselves did not have the money but were ready to help with their connections in political circles. In return, they wanted a small stake in the casino. De Villiers offered it to Jose Miguel and he gladly agreed. The only catch here was that Battle had never run a casino. You might argue, well, what's the big deal? Hire some knowledgeable experts and it's a cakewalk. Well, that's true, but only in theory. In reality, Battle did hire knowledgeable people, gave them good salaries and a cut to the manager. Everything was fine for a while. The manager put together a great team, and the casino itself was a rave, since before then there were no establishments like it in the country. But then competitors began to open up and Battle, who by that time had completely lost control, arrived in Peru. More and more often, he began to wipe his nostrils with blow. Jose Miguel behaved in the casino like some medieval prince in his castle, doing whatever he could think of. He was always drunk or stoned, disorderly, harassing women, and threatening to kill someone every day. Moreover, his new mistress got the opportunity to decide on the personnel affairs of the institution, though somewhat nervously. After that, her numerous relatives started to appear instead of experienced employees. The manager was the first to go. Then the head of security left. He warned Battle that snorting powder in the hallway under the cameras was not a good idea. Jose Miguel accused him of invasive surveillance and threatened to kill him. After that, there was a constant turnover, because no one wanted to work in such a mess. It eventually led to problems with attendance. People wanted to play in a good institution with professional staff, something that was unrealistic with such an incompetent owner. It ended with the manager suing Battle. He had a dispute over compensation for his share, and Jose Miguel did not want to pay. And instead, he only threatened to kill him. The investigation began, and it was discovered that Battle lived in Peru on a fake passport, so he was deported from the country back to the States. The casino still operated for a while, but eventually closed due to losses. Battle's deportation back to America was a wonderful gift to the authorities. From the moment he left for Peru on a fake passport, law enforcement simply lost track of him. That is, in theory, if Jose Miguel hadn't acted like a bad version of The Godfather, he could have actually gone off the radar and quietly run the organization from another country without fear of ending up behind bars. Now that he was back in the US, the chance of going to jail again was multiplied, as the authorities had been trying to pull this off for a very long time, and weren't about to stop. A couple of times they even came quite close to doing it. First, they almost caught battle in a killing contract. They intercepted a call from one of his subordinates who was arranging a hit for another man. And then they started listening to Jose Miguel's cell phones, waiting for that subordinate to call with a report on the outcome of the case. The whole thing blew up literally a few steps before the finish. El Padrino somehow found out about the wiretap and stopped talking business on the phone. Most likely, Battle had his own man among the investigative team, because a similar scenario repeated several more times, when a couple of steps before his denunciation, Jose Miguel stopped all actions that could indicate his guilt. Another way to put Battle away was to try to get his hitmen to talk. Someone from the corporation was always going to jail, but none of them wanted to cooperate. Jose Miguel took very good care of his hitmen while they were incarcerated. Their families weren't left needing anything, and neither were they themselves, receiving constant money transfers to their prison accounts. 
The Bolita bankers were similarly silent. They were busted from time to time for illegal gambling, money laundering, or tax evasion, but none of them, even if they pleaded guilty, ever said a word about El Padrino. Everyone knew how it could end, and no one wanted to repeat the fate of Idalia Fernandez, the witness from the Ernestico case who was found dead on the floor of her own apartment. So when Battle was deported from Peru for entering on forged documents, the authorities jumped at the chance. Forging documents was a federal offense, and this was a great chance to get a hold of Jose Miguel. Some months after his return and all the bureaucratic nuances, police obtained an arrest warrant for Battle, as well as a search warrant for his luxury home in Miami. There, law enforcers found, among other things, a loaded shotgun and a pistol, for which there was no authorization as well as indirect evidence that Jose Miguel was one of the sponsors of radical, anti-Castro formations. The latter would have no effect on his fate, but was a good marker that he had never come to terms with the loss of his homeland. On the charge of passport forgery, lawyers were able to get a suspended sentence for battle for pleading guilty, but the case of illegal possession of weapons went to trial, where Jose Miguel received 18 months in prison. He was released in March 1999. At first glance, El Patrino by that time looked like an ordinary 70-year-old man with health problems, but in the corporation, he was still an undisputed leader. To the new, younger members of the organization, he was virtually a legend, a man who had built an illegal business from scratch, bringing in millions of dollars a week, and yet had never served 10 years in prison during his entire career, constantly evading punishment for his crimes. That was until 2005, when law enforcement arrested him in a RICO case surrounding the corporation. They had witnesses who could corroborate Battle's connection to a series of arson attacks on illegal lottery outlets. As a witness, they had Vincent Gaffaro, a man who was the corporation's contact with Tony Salerno and the Genovese family, and who could attest to the existence of a conspiracy to run illegal gambling operations with millions of dollars in sales and Robert Hopkins, La Compañía's contact with the Lucchese family who could verify the same as Cafaro. Plus, the authorities had pulled up a couple of cases of money laundering by corporation members, as well as uncovered a system where Miguelito and Rides were funneling Bolita money into the legal sector. Of course, there was no shortage from the casinos. Law enforcers were able to prove that they were being used to launder the cash money being brought there from the U.S. In 2006, more than 20 people, including Jose Miguel Battle, were to be tried in this case, but only nine went to trial. Someone admitted to being guilty in advance, and someone completely flipped to the side of the witnesses. The trial itself lasted six months. El Padrino pleaded guilty after two months of proceedings and received 20 years in prison. His son Miguelito received 15 years in prison. Abraham Rides first switched sides and became a witness, but not getting enough benefit for it was given the same 15 years, and in the end, committed suicide. After his trial, and in view of his deteriorating health, Jose Miguel was authorized to be treated in a foreign hospital. He was accepted by Colombia, where he spent his last years. By that time, he had already been diagnosed with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, liver sclerosis, and hepatitis B as well as kidney and liver failure. He eventually died of the latter in August 2007. After his death and the sentencing of its top gang members, the corporation lost its former credibility. As of now, there is no evidence to suggest that there is serious force in the American underworld.